chapter 7. What I want you to look at with me is I want you to understand where the Jewish people were in the 7th chapter of the book of Ezra. <clears throat> so in chapter 7 and verse 1 we have Artaxerxes as the king. Hold your place here for a minute and go to Ezra 1. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. Who was the king in Ezra chapter 1? Cyrus. Cyrus. This was a period of time of 538, 538 B.C. The time we're looking at now is 458. Someone do the math for me. 
How long a period of time was it from the beginning of the book of Esther, the first half, to the beginning of the second half? 80 years. 80 years. So people had already been living in Judah and in Jerusalem for 80 years. They had had children and they had had grandchildren by the time Ezra comes. So Ezra brings a group of people with him. He brings with him priests and people who would be temple workers to basically man the temple. You'll see that. Ezra, you can see in the chapter 7, the first few verses, had a very esteemed lineage. He was a direct descendant of Aaron. Who was Aaron? Who was Aaron? The brother of Moses and the first high priest. Ezra, this man, is a direct descendant. Well, this is one thing I, I say to people when you're studying the Bible. <clears throat> Isn't it incredible how much information we are given? When you start taking a look at the early part of the book of Ezra, you have a listing of every single family, every single family that made this move. There were 50,000 people that made the move, and we have the listing of every single one of them. So I want you to understand, when we come into Ezra chapter 7, where he's gone through and spent a lot of time, if you read in this, finding peace that people that were priests and that could prove their lineage. We start this book with the, absolute, the lineage of Ezra. He was the descendant of, of Aaron through, I want you to look at it, look at early part of chapter 7. Aaron had four sons. One was called Nadab. One was called Abihu. Who was the last two? Ithamar and Eliezer. Anybody remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu? They were killed by God. Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, these, one of these boys, or both of them, were the heir apparent to being the second high priest. And fire came out and consumed them. So the next lineage of high priests were a combined high priesthood between the other two sons of Aaron. This is the lineage of Ezra as we move into chapter 7. So I want you to take a look at that as we start our discussion. Byron, would you lead us in prayer, please? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity you've given us to be here tonight and study your word. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with Brother Rick as he brings us our lesson tonight. That we be edified and strengthened and become better Christians because of it. Dear Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sins and be with us always. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So begin with me now in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 1. After these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up to uh, Ezra, and you can see various people there. There are a number of people that I want you to think about. When you take a look at uh, the first verse, Azariah is mentioned, Azariah mentioned several times in scripture. Anybody ever heard the name Hilkiah? Hilkiah. Very prominent. Hilkiah did something that was very important. You remember when Josiah, Josiah was the little king that God built, and he was a godly man. And they were cleaning out the temple, the old temple, before it was destroyed. <clears throat> and there was a man that found something in the temple. Something that was incredible and nobody had ever seen before. What was it? The book of the law. That man was Hilkiah. Hilkiah was his name. So you see, this is the list of all of Zadok, which is a very common, uh, popular high priest. So in verse 6 now, in verse 5, you can see Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. So that is Ezra's lineage. In verse 6, Ezra went up to Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses when the Lord God of Israel had given all the kings, granted him all he requested because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. So the first thing you see as you move into chapter 7 was 
everything that Ezra wanted, he got. The hand of the Lord was on him, and everybody knew it was on him. The hand of the Lord was also on Artaxerxes the king. You'll see that in just a moment. In verse 8, And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, in the seventh year of the king. For on the first of the month he began to go up from Babylon, on the first and the fifth month that he came from Babylon to Jerusalem, because the good hand of God was upon him. Look at verse 10. For, so we have twice, the good hand of God was upon him. For, verse 10, what does verse 10 tell you? Ezra did what? That his father stood in the law, which would have been the history of other people that had been. So to study the law and practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances, that was what, what Ezra was made of. He was that kind of man. So he will lead a second group of people. So here is a group of people, around 50,000 total people, that come, you can see in the first two chapters of the book of Ezra. Now, 80 years later, some people will say, a number of books will say 75, so you can... Uh, you can decide what you like there. In 458, there will be another group of people. And what you're going to see in the next chapter or so is them making sure that people's lineage was intact, that we know who these people are, gathering money together. Where is Ezra? We just read it a couple of, about a minute ago. Where was he before he left to come to Judah? Babel. He was still in Babel where all these people had come from several generations before. So you have the second group of people coming through, and I'm going to tell you that under the book of Nehemiah, you're going, in 444, you're going to have the third. So there will be three groups of people that will, that will head from Babylon, or that part of the world, from Egypt or Babylon, into Jerusalem. And they're coming from other places too. Oh. <coughs> absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> Now look, take a look at this. I want to look in verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 18, chapter 7 and verse 18 of Ezra. And whatever seemed good to you and to your brothers, do it with the rest of the silver and gold that you may have according to the will of God. Verse 20, and the rest of the needs. So here is the king as he is talking to him, and he's building this plan about going here to uh, Jerusalem. And what the king says is, anything you need. He even gives a list of, of how much do you need here. And when you get there, if you run short, look what he says in verse, 18, uh, verse 20. And the rest of the needs are the house of your God from which you may have occasion to provide. Provide it from where? The royal treasury. Now, you want to talk about the difference between the Jewish people prior to the book of Ezra. They were basically slaves. They were hated. They were despised. God hated them uh, of sorts. Uh, they were destroyed over and over again by the Assyrian kings and the Babylonian kings. <clears throat> All of a sudden, you come into the book of Ezra, and the first king, Cyrus, says, God appointed me to build him a house, and I'm going to make sure it gets done. That house has been built. 516 is when the temple was completed. So the temple building has now been up for a while. It's been up for close to 50 years by the time the second group of people comes. So the king is saying, I, <clears throat> I'm going to help you raise the money. I'm going to give you the money here. And when you get there, if you're short of anything, you take it from the royal treasury that is there. In verse 21, Artaxerxes issues a decree. And here's the decree to all the treasurers who were in the provinces to make sure that they know what he just told Ezra. And he, it says, um, Ezra the priest, about the middle of verse 21, the scribe of the law of God in heaven may require of you. Whatever he asks of you, you give it to him. Verse 22, even up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a uh, hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of oil, salt is needed. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal from the house of God of heaven, lest there be wrath against the kingdom of the, the kingdom of the king and his sons. Look at that verse with me for a moment. What was I, I 
have this conversation with people pretty often. Well, God's a God of love. God doesn't want people to fear him. Why not? That's respect. What was it that was driving Artaxerxes to want to make God as happy as he could make him? Fear. Fear. Absolute fear. He had seen all the nations round about. This is the one thing you see all the way from the time. You remember when the, the spies had a conversation with Rahab? You remember in, in Jericho? She knew a story that had happened 40 years before. How God had opened the Red Seas up and his people had marched across. But after the Red Sea, uh, after they had crossed, what happened right after that? So there's a beautiful song, the song of Moses that we sing about in the Lamb by and by. So Miriam, Ezra, uh, uh, Moses' sister, teaches them a song. And in the song it says that you could see chariots and helmets and dead bodies of the Egyptians all up and down the Red Sea. That was the story that this woman, when she decided that she was going to put her life on the line and her family's life, it was because she had seen what God does when he gets upset. So in this text, verse 23, what is commanded of the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal for the house of God of heaven, lest there be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons. We also inform you that it is not allowed to impose any tax or tribute or toll or any of the, or in, on any of the priests, Levites, singers, and so forth. Verse 25, you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river, even all of those who know the law of God, and you may teach any who are ignorant of them. What does this say from a practical point of view? What else does Ezra have the ability to do when he brings this next group of people back to Judah? What did our Xerxes just give him control of. They're learning. But even governing himself. Right? You don't have to live under our laws. We're not going to have a governor like you had but back in Jerusalem. His name was Patani. That was some years ago. You are in control of appointing anybody you want to to be the judges and to be the sheriff and to be the police department. You be in charge of all of that. If you go back in history, I can tell you that that had not been true for a long time. All the way back to the time of Hezekiah and before, they were living under some mock rule because um, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and others were controlling them. <clears throat> now look down a little bit further in chapter 7. <coughs> he says you even have the right to teach other people around your laws. If, if you desire. Verse 26. And whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed on him swiftly, whether for death or banishment or for confiscation of goods or imprisonment. <laughs> let that soak in for a minute. We've now been studying all the way through the story of King Saul and King David and King Solomon. And then we took a look at the northern kingdom until it went away. And now we're taking a look at the southern kingdom. And now you have a Persian king named Artaxerxes that says, Ezra, I'm going to let you set your own government up. The rest of the world is going to be under my control, but I'm going to let you set your own government up. I'm going to let you determine who the magistrates are going to be, who all of the leaders are going to be. You can teach anybody you want to your law. And above and beyond that, if anybody violates your law, what happens? He says, we'll take care of it. You think about for just a moment, let that soak in. We are sitting here now about 450 years before the, the birth of Jesus Christ. 480 years later, the Jewish people hated Jesus. And they wanted to kill him so badly. What was the problem with the Jews killing Jesus? They had zero power to execute anybody. They had a puppet government. 
they had to make the case to the Romans, right? Who, who crucified Jesus? Romans. It was the Romans. Because by the time that you, you open up your books to the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Jewish people were not in control of their own government. They were not in control of being able to teach anything they wanted to teach. So you see a tremendous situation here. Yes. And there had to be a reason for that. Absolutely. And what was the reason? They were doing God's will. Playing men as always did. <clears throat> it's amazing. You can, you can follow this throughout all of history. When uh, Jacob was a young man and he got married, the man who his name will become Israel, and he's working for his father-in-law. His name was Laban. Laban figured out something pretty fast about Jacob. You know what it was? Everything he touched turned to gold. Do you know that that happened with Joseph, the young man who was in prison? It was pretty clear that every single thing he touched turned to gold. Now, how did that happen? It happened because, as we have read several times, the hand of the Lord was upon him, was upon these individuals. In chapter 8 and verse 1, now these are the heads of the family household and genealogical enrollment of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. When I teach people that have Bible studies about, well, how do we know the Bible is authentic? How do we know the Bible is real? How do we know it's from God? Can you think about the incredible volumes of detail that is in this book? Incredible volumes. Not only, just go back for just a moment to Ezra chapter 2. <clears throat> Look at Ezra chapter 2 and verse 1. This was the original 50,000, including both free men and slaves. Take a look at this from each family. In verse 3, the sons of Parosh, 2,172. The sons, verse 5, the sons of Era, 775. He gives you intricate detail of all of the people that were here. When you take a look at Ezra chapter 8, he's coming back here with 1,334 people, if you add them up. 1,334 people that were priests and that were temple people who could participate. They were uh, <clears throat> from a priestly origin. How much detail are we given about these 1,334 people? To the individual person. Every single family. Every single family and the number of people involved in it. Now take a look in verse 15. <clears throat> so now they have the money. They've got the approval from Artaxerxes. He couldn't uh, originally, if you back up a little bit, he couldn't find as many as he wanted to. So he went to many of the leading priests. Uh, in uh, Babylon, in areas round about, and pleaded with them, help me get some quality priests to come with me. So eventually he gets them all settled in, and they, they are now in verse 15, assembled at the river that runs to Ahava, where we camped for three days, and when I observed the people and the priests, I did not find any Levites there. So he's still short of people that could still do certain functions. So he sends for, and he uh, names the various people there. In verse 17, the latter part, I need temple servants. I need people, if you remember, this goes way back in history, but I'm going to just talk about it for a second. Levi had three sons. He had a son named Kohath. Kohath is the descendants, or from him came Aaron and Moses and um, several others. He had one named Ithamar and one named Merari, M-E-R-A-R-I. All of these were priests, but only these could be, the, uh, all of these were holy to the Lord, I should say. Only from this family could priests come. It was these men that would take care of keeping the fire burning. It would, would take care of putting the uh, tabernacle up and taking it down and doing various functions, but they were not priests. They were from the tribe of Levi. He didn't have enough of these. He knew what it was going to take, and he didn't have enough. So he's looking for temple workers. You can see in verse 17. 
in verse 18, and according to the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of insight of the son of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel. And he talks about his name and who he was. In verse 19, 18 men they found from one, one sect of uh, the descendants of Levi. In uh, verse 20, 220 temple servants. So he's now putting his team together. <clears throat> verse 21, I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Hava that we might humble ourselves to the Lord our God to seek from him a safe journey for us our little ones and all our possessions. Now look in verse 22. I want, you to, I want you to focus on this for a minute. Why was he concerned about making this trip from Babylon to Jerusalem safely? He didn't have any royal guards with him. We... Uh, after my lesson Sunday on, on conquering giants, I must have had a dozen people had comments or thoughts about that. Do you think Ezra was afraid that he wasn't going to make it, that he could physically die? I want you to look at a phrase that's interesting to me in verse 22. Verse 22. For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way because uh, we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. What does he tell you in that text? He trusted God, right? He trusted God, but he was praying, they were praying that they made it safely. But he said, I was ashamed to have to ask the, the king. After I just told him, I just left there saying, the hand of God is upon us, and he wants us to go back and build this building, but I'm still a little bit concerned. <laughs> Why do you think we pray here, and I guess every congregation I, I've ever been a part of, that when somebody goes on a trip, that they will have a safe return home? Why do we do that? God to watch over him. That's our bizarre. You think it has any impact on what actually happens? When somebody is about to have surgery and we're praying for them and we all offer special prayers and we offer public prayers, we offer private prayers, do we really think that we can have any impact on how that person's surgery turns out? Yes, of course. If you didn't, why pray? What would we pray for if you didn't really believe that? Now, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen and what was going to be upon them as they passed through the land of their enemies. But what he says is, I was ashamed to ask the king after I told him that God's hand is upon us. So here's what he does in verse, <clears throat> verse 23. So this is how they fixed the problem. We fasted and we sought our God concerning the matter and he listened to us, uh, our entreaty. What does the word entreaty mean? Ask him. Yeah. Petition, begging, pleading. We're pleading with him that he allows us to get there safely. Now look a little bit further. <clears throat> In verse 20, uh, 31, so we journeyed from the river Ahava. So now they've gotten everybody together. They, they have been staying for multiple days right by this river, the, uh, just out of Babylon. He's got all of his people together. I've got the number of people that I think I need. I've got temple servants. I have priests. I have people that, are, that, that we can check their lineage. And so now they're ready to go. In verse, uh, verse uh, 24, I set apart 12 of the leading priests, and he lists all of them, and he weighed out silver for them that they would need along the way. In verse uh, 28, I said to them, now let me just make a quick point. If you study the book of Ezra, you learn something. In the second half of the book, the book is written in first person. You just see, I said it was written in first person. The first half of the book over here was not written in first person. Why? Ezra was here. 
He was a part of it. He was, but this is 80 years before, or at least 60 or 70 years before he was born. So he's a historian, and he's writing First and Second Chronicles, and he writes the book of Nehemiah, and he writes the first half of Ezra, but he wasn't actually there. So the entire second half of the book, as you see here, I did this, and I did this, and I talked to the king. He was a part of it. Now look at this a little bit further as we go on. So he says in chapter 8 now, in <clears throat> verse 28, I said to them, you are holy to the Lord, and the utensils are holy, and the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord your, your Father. Uh, verse 30, the priests and the Levites accepted the weight of silver and gold and utensils to bring them to Jerusalem, the house of God. So we journeyed from the river of Hava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem, and the hand of God was over us, and he delivered us from the hand of our enemies and the ambushes by the way. Not only... Are they uh, afraid that somebody didn't have gotten a message that the man that rules the world says we can do whatever we want to do? It just so happens they're carrying millions of dollars of gold and silver. So there might be a few unscrupulous people that they could have run into across the way. So he was been worried in verse 31 about ambushes. In verse 35, the exiles who had come from the captivity offered burnt offerings to God of Israel, 12 bulls of Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs. If you go all the way back to the latter part of, first part of Ezra, even before when they couldn't build the temple and they couldn't agree to build it, they built an altar. And they built this altar according to the exact specifications that the law of Moses taught. And so now they are utilizing this when they get into Jerusalem. In chapter 9 now, <clears throat> chapter 9 and verse 2, for they have taken some of the daughters as wives. Ezra gets back. Let's just read verse 1 and then we'll talk about this together. Uh, chapter 9 and verse 1. 9 and 1, now when these things had been completed, the princes approached me. So they're there. They have about 1,300 people who are Levites and priests, and they come amongst the people, and they find something out that's highly disturbing to them. I'm going to tell you it's dealt with again in the book of Nehemiah. Anybody know what the concern was? They were intermarrying with the uh, heathen worshipers. Now, what's wrong with that? In this period of time, under the law of Moses, what was wrong with that? They were forbidden. The law of Moses specifically, directly, absolutely forbid Jewish people from marrying non-Jewish people. Now you get to thinking about all the way back to the early part of the book of Ezra, how detailed they were, how specific. Ezra, we're told, is a man who was a man of the law. He was, he was disciplined in the law. But there have now been people living here for 80 years. And in that 80-year period of time, significant numbers of them had taken foreign wives. Could they participate in temple worship if they were married to foreigners? They could not. <clears throat> now, it's hard to make an analogy today of Christians marrying non-Christians, but I'm going to tell you in this period of time, the, <clears throat> the, the kings, the, the Persian kings, and certainly uh, Ezra in this case, he wanted people to know the exact law. I want to show you something in just a minute. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. So this happened a short time after what we're talking about here. The first time, the first time Ezra takes the book of the law and he stands up on the podium and he's going to start reading it. I want you to see something that happens. This is how serious these people were. In verse of chapter 8 of Nehemiah, verse 1, all the people gathered as one man at the square, the, the, the front gate, and they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which they had. In verse 3, he read it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, people who could understand, 
all were attentive to the book of the law. In verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people. When he opened the book, what happened? They all stood up. And Ezra said, The Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. While lifting up their hands, they bowed down low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. In verse 7, the latter part of that verse, they remained in their place. In verse 9, the latter part of verse 9, for all the people were doing what? Weeping. And they heard the word of the law. This event happens a relatively short time after what we're talking about here. These people were serious about this. So in chapter 9, back now to Ezra 9 and 1. <clears throat> when the people had been, uh, when all things had been com completed, the prince approached uh, the uh, princes approached me, saying, "The people of Israel and all of the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land according to their abominations." And he talks about the various nations that th they had determined that there were some of them married to Jewish people. For they have taken some of the daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and their holy race has intermingled with the people of the land. Indeed, the hand of the prince and the rulers had foremost had been foremost in the unfaithful. Some of the leaders were the most unfaithful. I want you to stop for a minute. Our time is about up. But I want you to turn with me to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 12, Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah 13. We'll close with this. As they began going through the entire <clears throat> nation of Judah, here is the assessment that Ezra makes. Ezra wrote the book of Nehemiah well, as well. Nehemiah 13 and 23. In those days, I saw that Jews had married women from Ashdod and Ammon and Moab, and their children half spoke the language of Ashdod, and none of them were able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. What was the problem with that? Because they would, when they went to worship, it would have been the, the other, the law would be, uh, I'm not saying it exactly right. But well, what language would you think that Ezra spoke? They were not able to be taught because they couldn't understand. They could not understand the language of the people of God. Now, you can see when, when people begin moving away and they begin intermarrying, you start having the things that come with that. But the, this now had gone on far enough. Half the children that they were trying to teach couldn't understand what the leaders were saying. And we'll, we will pick that up, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. David will be here Sunday. This is what had happened in the 80 years from the time that Ezra brought these people until the time we're talking about right here was significant numbers of them had intermarried and their children could not speak the language. They spoke the language of Ashdod or the land, language of Ammon. So now you have the high priest and you have all the priests that were brought back here with Ezra. And when they're talking, the children cannot understand. We'll talk about that. Any questions before we, we close down? Do you see how that uh, could happen? Do you see how people who get too involved? I'm going to tell you, um, in 2 Corinthians 6.14... The Apostle Paul gives us a warning, and the warning is, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But just turn there for a second with me. We'll close with this. Because what he, what he teaches after that, what he quotes is right from the law of Moses. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <coughs> In verse 14, do not be 
2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked or be bound with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial or the devil? And what believer a believer has in common with an unbeliever? When you take a look at the quotations from the Old Testament that you see in verses 16, 17, and 18, what you're going to find is they come right out of the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus. Where do you think these verses came from? They were pulled from the very law that these people had violated to the extreme. So Lord willing, we will pick that up next Wednesday evening.
Let us pray. Our most gracious to the Father, we're thankful for this midweek service that we're able to gather here to study the word and sing praises to you. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that this evening we take the lesson that we've heard and apply it to our lives and be better Christians and be better examples to others and be edified. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, you uh, be with our shut-ins and our sick, the, the ones of our members who are, are working at this time. We ask to be with everyone and comfort them. And we pray for their uh, soon return at the next appointed time. We ask your Heavenly Father, you uh, continue to bless us and, and uh, be with us. And, and we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that all things we do here in this congregation will be according to your uh, will and be a, a shining light into the community here. We ask your Heavenly Father that you remain with us uh, this hour and, and uh, take us safely home and, and uh, forgive us of our many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a portent of glory divine! Heaven and salvation, virtues of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. Sermon on the Mount. 
And it, towards the end of that sermon, in the 21st verse of the 7th chapter, he says a verse that we like to use. And it says this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. I want to bring your attention to this word, me. Consider what Jesus is saying in that word, me. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying that I am the one that you need to talk to. I'm the one you need to recognize. I'm the one with authority. Let's continue reading and see what else we find there. Many shall say to me, in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and by thy name cast out demons? and by thy name do many mighty works. Again, we have the word me. Indicating they're going to have to answer to Jesus. And therefore, he goes on to say, and then I will profess unto them, I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work in it. Everyone that, therefore, that hear these words of mine, and doeth them shall be likened to the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Another group of verses that assure these people that he knows what he's talking about. You have to pay attention to what I am telling you, Jesus said. And he's told them a lot of things in this Sermon on the Mount. And everyone that heareth these words of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the flood came, and the wind blew and smote upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. Now that's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. But please notice the next two verses as well. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these words, the multitude were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Jesus taught with so much authority that these people are astonished. They're used to the scribes teaching us. But if you look up the scribes in the Old Testament when they first talked about, and you look up at the one we've been talking about tonight, Ezra was a scribe, they had authority. Their authority was to teach the law of God. But that authority, like so many other things about the Jews at this time, was eroded to the point where some other people were also teaching. And these people were called rabbi. And I'll just side for you. We spoke of Jesus going into the Jews' synagogue. I want you to understand, if you don't already, that the word synagogue is not in the Old Testament. The actual building of the synagogues and the meeting of the synagogues did not come with the law of Moses. Also, the word rabbi is not in the Old Testament. It's a New Testament concept. It's something that developed in this period of time that we've been talking about. And a thing called the Talmud. But we're not going to go into that now. The Jews should have recognized that Jesus, as a teacher from God, had authority. And the reason they should have recognized that is the first verse that I read tonight. And that is that Jesus was 
doing things that no other person had ever done. He was doing things that people could not do. The only power he could have to do this had to come from God. So they should have recognized the power of Jesus, but they were astonished at it. Jesus had that kind of authority. I'm going to turn now to Matthew 5 and verse 20 and read this. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here again, the word scribe is used. But here again, Jesus is explaining to them that their authority and their rightness with God had been eroded to the point that any of you that want to be in the kingdom of God are going to have to do better than the scribes and the Pharisees are doing. That's just part of the thing that Jesus is introducing to them that shows that they're not right with God. Now, I'm going to talk to you just a minute about Mark 16, 15 and 16. When Jesus commissioned his apostles, just think about it now, for three years, he'd been teaching. He had died. He'd been resurrected. And we're told 500 men saw him ascend to the heaven. People recognize now that Jesus was the Christ. And people need to recognize right now that Jesus was saying the will of God. When he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If you haven't been baptized, you really need to. We are concerned that you haven't had your sins washed away. Is the reason we take this time to read these scriptures and say these words to you. And if you have been and you feel like in your heart of hearts that you're not right with God, we can help you with that too. Won't you come forward as we stand and sing for your encouragement? All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live I surrender all
the surgery up in Freeport, and that's why they're not here. They're traveling uh, this, this week. The, the only other thing, I, I'd like the congregation to uh, pray for uh, Kelly Carrington. Kelly Carrington is the wife of Shane Carrington. Shane Carrington is the preacher there in Sulphur Springs uh, at Southside, at the Southside Congregation. It's the congregation where my parents were members. Uh, Kelly was found to have a rare uh, type of cancer. She's at MD Anderson uh, today. I, I, I had uh, back and forth emails with Shane, and she's at MD Anderson today. And they have met with the doctors, and they're trying to plan her surgery and trying to uh, get her into surgery. But I'd ask the congregation to pray for Shane and to pray for Kelly during this time and uh, that uh, the doctors that are rendering aid to her, that the best will come from that. And so I thank, thank the congregation for praying for Kelly. All right. Let us remember Kelly Carrington in our prayers. And let us remember the clinic's oldest son. Let us pray. Our most heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. We appreciate the uh, sending your son down so we might have everlasting life. Please be with Rick and the elders as they bring the word to us. Be with those that are shut in. Be with those that are sick. Bring them back to the most needed and wanted health if that is I wish. Be with those that are traveling. Bring them back to their destination safely. Be with that old working. Bring them back to their loved ones safely. We take this time to pray for the names that were brought up and keep them in our everyday prayers so they may be, get back to their most needed and wanted health. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.